As you can imagine, technique is everything. NHLiberty.org Adam Kokesh's armed march on Washington. A sufficiently big deal, causing a large enough number of original thoughts that it requires additional commentary. I want to stress the main thing that the mainstream media probably will not stress. That is that Kokesh has given the authorities a huge out if they want to take it. All they have to do is line up on the bridge in such a position that they're preventing anyone from actually crossing into D.C. They'd have to shove their way into D.C. Provided riot police set up in the correct location. Now, the authorities may not do this. Okay, again, I should back up. Kokesh has said that his people will turn around uh, if they're met with something like that. Or they, won't, they won't push forward physically. They'll just stand there on the Virginia side. Both sides, if they chose, could pretty easily come out of this fairly undamaged, both politically and physically. But these things have a way of taking on a life of their own, so that may not be what happens. I just wanted to stress it, since the mainstreamers may not. I've also been wondering why no one has come up with some of the obvious names for this event. I, 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 Kokash has given it some kind of name that's almost completely forgettable, but... For me, it obviously lends itself to million something March, right? And since the, I mean, well, this is America, so there's thousands of different words for rifle, right? <laughs> or at least hundreds. Um, so you could call it the Million Mag March. You could call it the Million Mauser March, the Million Musket March, the Million Makarov March, or the Million Mossberg March. Does Mossberg make rifles? Hopefully, we will not end up calling it the Million Massacre March. As Adam attempts his continued effort to liberate the wrong state. Uh, I guess D.C. is not a state. As of May 6th, he already had 2,600 people listed as going or maybe going on his Facebook page. So he's certainly succeeding when it comes to getting numbers. I mean, compare that to what we do in New Hampshire, and it's, it's, it's huge. But to make change on Washington, you have to have numbers that are generally, you know, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 100 times as great as the numbers you have in New Hampshire. Maybe even we could say you might have to have numbers 300 times as great to make change in Washington as you have to have to make change in New Hampshire. Because uh, New Hampshire only constitutes one, uh, I guess, one third of a percent of the nation's population. So he could have an event that triggers a huge amount of attention, a large number of people. From a PR standpoint, it could go perfectly his way. And yet, I don't know that it would make any change on Washington. Not so with much smaller events in New Hampshire. As one state rep put it, when we got a bill... And a lot of people show up to talk about it. We listen. We pay attention. And this is true. Mainly for selfish political reasons. Because people actually can be voted out around here. Because the Republicans and Democrats actually are different around here. Here, things count. There, I don't know. I've clicked decline on the event. As in declining to attend. Although... I would do this for any event in Washington, at least if I wanted to comment on the event. I, I mean, I definitely, I just wouldn't attend any event in Washington. In the case of Adam's event, I've clicked decline mainly so I can contribute, you know, to the discussion and uh, uh, post on the Facebook wall. I usually, I preferred, I, would, I wish you didn't have to click decline, actually, in order to, to post on a Facebook event. But decline often indicates that you're undercutting a given event. And I do not believe it would be appropriate for me to either undercut or support Adam's event. Everything I do in relation to it should be complementary toward human rights in general. It should be a position most people can support. Unlike the event itself, which will tend to be viewed as fringe, and unlike the federal reaction to it, which will, whatever they do, surely be unconstitutional. And 
an unnecessary expense to taxpayers. Anyway, I think not going totally appropriate. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, uh, an event in World War One where King Albert of the Belgians, one of the more competent players in that awful affair, uh, toward the beginning, the, the Germans were in a certain position, and the British and French tried to talk King Albert into committing his entire army to an attack, which would have essentially destroyed the army. Well, he was one of the few people, right, at the beginning of the war who understood that the war had shifted over to the defensive, right? The, the defense had the advantage with the weaponry of the day. And attacking was generally a bad idea. His forces had just inflicted pretty grievous losses on the Germans that were coming forward with superior forces. So he refused to attack. This was considered one of the more brilliant moves in World War I was King Albert's decision to not attack toward the beginning of the war. He kept his army on the defensive, kept it in Belgium, and kept it alive. Well, I think parts of it were in Belgium. Of course, his army contributed over and over again to the war effort for the next four years, and eventually was on the winning side. Eventually got every square inch of territory back. But they fought smart, not audaciously. Now, inevitably, when you look at comments on his Facebook page or wherever else, the term civil war comes up alarmingly more and more, and people aren't necessarily talking about the last civil war. And I would hope not a one of them is excited or thrilled at the prospect of it happening again. Because it would just be ugly. You would lose. Maybe the concept of good guys and bad guys would go out the window pretty early on. It almost always does in civil wars, with a few exceptions. I want to reiterate the reasons why waging war on Washington is questionable. They're not the same reasons that everyone else gives. For instance, I don't stay peaceable because I fear their weapons or power. Well, I do fear them, but that's not the reason that I don't fight them violently. I don't stay peaceable because they're evil or because I don't think that American people could defeat them. Their weapons cry out for action. Their power cries out for action. They're evil especially. And yes, they could be defeated resoundingly, violently. But that's not the problem. The problem is what comes on the other side of such a defeat. Toppling dictators it, it, violently is easy compared to achieving a pro-liberty gain on the other side. That rarely happens. Again, you look at the, the least bad revolutions in history, the American Revolution, the Irish Revolution in 1921, and what you got on the other side of it was not generally more freedom. Or at best, it was just slightly more freedom. What they got was new tyrants or fratricide. Look, Americans within 20 years, well, maybe I should say within 30 years of the a revolutionary war were banned from engaging in trade <laughs> you, you could not put a cargo on a ship and sell it to Portugal there was starvation in an agricultural paradise under Jefferson the colonies of 1760 were far freer than that at least in this one respect Yes, additional liberties uh, in some areas did accrue from the American Revolution. But again, it didn't achieve that much. And it was, uh, it was a possibly the least bad violent revolution in history. Most violent revolutions result in a situation that's much worse than what came before. <clears throat> Look at the French Revolution, the Soviet Revolution. I'm talking about, well, the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. Libya, Syria. Violent revolutions just tend to not work. They, they work in the sense that you show the bad guys, but we're not here to show the bad guys. We're not here to show the feds that we can hurt them. We're here to make a better life possible for all Americans, including feds. Another problem that sort of occurred to me as I was mulling this over, and I didn't really, I couldn't put my finger on what it was at first, but I think 
it's the idea of approaching or moving toward something while armed. I'm always reluctant to even move towards someone with a camera. I mean, I wait for them to walk past, basically. But approaching uh, sort of gives the impression of initiating or aggressing in some cases. Yes, Kokesh says they'll stop for the police line or whatever, and they won't try to push forward past it. But if this breaks down into a, 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 a crisis, average folk won't even know that. They won't even know that happened. That Adam offered to stop, or that he planned to stop, or that he did stop. They'll get their news about it from sources that won't tell them this, or will bury that part. Oh, another problem. And again, I, I'm thinking up problems with this protest, and then things I like about it, one at a time, and they're just kind of coming out stream of consciousness. So again, I'm not necessarily taking a side as to whether this is a good idea. I'm just saying I've got a lot of, it's making me talk a lot, right? It's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of things I don't like about it. There's some things I like about it. So, and again, ticking, ticking them off, <laughs> ticking another one off as I tick them off one by one. Um, let's think about what Sun Tzu would have to say about this. Probably I could come up with 10 different relative, uh, relevant quotes, but here's the one that popped into mind. A quote, you may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points. You may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. Unquote. Now, Kokesh is sort of pulling a Ludendorff here, in the sense that Ludendorff, in the German uh, high commander, in, or one of the high commanders in World War I, was famous for attacking the enemy at his strong point. And he was very good at it, but... Again, he wasn't following Sun Tzu's advice when he did this. So over time, it cost him a lot of men. Uh, in the same way, Kokash is making directly for what he considers the enemy, strong point. Now, you sort of do this in civil disobedience. But again, this is not going to be perceived as civil disobedience. At least not by, by certain people. Many certain people. If the spit hits the fan... We all need to think about what our appropriate role in it is, as free staters. For me, what I think, my role thus far has, I would hope, always been to try and keep a violent conflict from breaking out. If I can't keep it from breaking out, then to delay it as long as possible. If I can't delay it, then to weigh in, to use what influence I have, to try and limit it. If unable to limit it, then at least to reduce its effects on the uninvolved. If unable to do that, then to document as best I can what is happening. Or failing that, to at least provide commentary. Aimed at a better outcome, at the at least the least bad possible outcome on the other end. So that's the sort of paradigm I set up for myself. In, in the fear of possible conflict in the U.S. Now that it seems more palpable, I guess it should be articulated. Make no mistake about this shit. If war happens, it will not be exciting. It will not be glorious. It will stink, literally. It will be mostly boring. It will not be what you see on TV with exciting bombs going off. It will be you in a cellar, you in a cell, you in a torture chamber, you with dead family members, you at funerals, you hungry. This sort of thing is twice as true for civil wars as it is for other kinds. If such a thing ever happens, at the very least, it has to be completely on the heads of the authorities. You and I can't allow our movement to take any of the blame. And again, that's what's so vexatious about this particular protest. One cannot, it, it, it's, one, one cannot condemn it without seeming craven, and one cannot support it without seeming reckless. And I cannot just speak off the top of my head about it without seeming both, depending on which minute you're listening to. 
So in a, in a sense, I hate talking about it, but that's what keeps me thinking about it. And the more I think, the more I think about it, the more things I have to say about it. Speaking of which, here's another thought. The timing of this is suspicious. Why is this... I hate to say this stuff, because I, I know Adam, and I'd like to believe he's on our side, that he's not some kind of federal plant. But the timing of this is suspicious in the sense that it's, it's being scheduled. He scheduled, he, he announced it, I guess, just as the pro-freedom forces are really, it seems like, getting the upper hand on the gun issue. Now, the thing has really kind of gone our way. The, the debate, the votes, the discussion, the attention, the visuals. There's a lot of really fun, interesting visuals around the country surrounding guns now that you never would have seen 10 years ago. Interesting images, video. Things have been going kind of okay. And yet now Adam pops in with this really, you know, uh, uh, risky thingamabobber. What's the, what would be the, the pro-liberty motive for doing this at this time? Now, rather than focus on trying to beat down whatever it is Adam's doing, it's really more appropriate to try and come up with something better. And then off the top of my head immediately, I can't tell you of something that's going to get more attention, but it, it, one brainstorm I had, what, what should I do about this? I thought maybe it might be appropriate to schedule something to happen in New Hampshire on July 4th while Adam's doing his thing in, in uh, Washington. My thought would be to uh, challenge some federal entity to a game of kickball or softball or something. And while they're having their craziness in D.C., we're just playing a game of kickball here. I don't know which federal entity would be the right ones to invite to such an event. And uh, again, this has to be handled carefully because you don't want to be on the side of the federal government in any way except for supporting their human rights as individuals and their, their prosperity as individuals legitimately gained. <laughs> they don't have that right now, but I mean, it, w it would have to be kind of clear that the the, the, the the kickball match really is a a little bit of a protest of its own. Uh, you know, maybe the the uh, the pro liberty side could be wearing shirts that say "Please don't shoot the people," and you invite the national guard right to play kickball with you, and you're all wearing shirts that say "Please don't shoot the people." So you're you're reaching out in a way that that is disarming. Um, to the feds as opposed to enabling. I don't know if National Guard would even be involved in something like this. I, I don't know that they would be involved in, in D.C. But um, we'll, we'll know more, I guess, before long as to which, you know, which entities exactly will be the ones coming down on Kokesh and they might be the ones to invite to play kickball. Federals, though, do make this kind of thing a little difficult by the fact that some of them are so inappropriate in the way they handle information, you know, I mean, they're very, very dangerous to talk to some of them. I mean, just, just, just to run your mouth in a conversation with the FBI saying the most polite, normal things um, can get you put in jail. So that might, for instance, rule them out as an institution we could invite. I, mean, I, I wish we could, but if you can't trust someone to honestly relay what you've said to them, they don't even record the people they question. If that trust is not there at all, then it, just, it becomes very difficult to interact with them at all. But in an event like this, it would be on our turf or on neutral turf, and you know we could all be running recorders, so maybe it would be safe to talk to the FBI in a circumstance like that where it's all recorded. I don't know. I don't know if the FBI will be involved in this at all. I don't know which entities would, but I, it isn't just an idea that has occurred to me off and on over the years. That if there's a certain conflict brewing, maybe it would be appropriate to... To, to have a, a, a sporting match of some kind with the bad guys. And maybe find out that some of them aren't quite so bad and let them figure the same thing out about us. Just some thoughts. You might have better ideas than this. These are the ones off the top of my head. Anyway, a softball game sort of gives the message, we are your opponents, but we're not your enemies. If, if, for instance, one of these were to happen in every state capital while the Kokesh's thing were happening, 
then uh, media in probably every state would have to report on that. I mean, if, if Kokesh's thing turns into a real crisis, then every local media outlet is going to be looking for some local angle on the crisis. And I think I might like to give them a local angle of a softball game. And this edition of the Ridley Report was brought to you by the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, working to fight for freedom in New, in New Hampshire State House. But you know how I'm always saying that if you if you do this at the New Hampshire State House, you're gonna you're gonna hit one of the one of the New Hampshire Liberty activists. Well, uh, let's just try it and see what happens. Uh, oh, hey, 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 hey. Uh, see, it works. See, if you if you do this at the New Hampshire State House, you will hit a member of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. This is David Ridley signing off for. BridleyReport.com, sponsored by NHLiberty. You guys can say it. NHLiberty.org. No, that's not how I say it. NHLiberty.org. <laughs> O-R-G. All right. Thanks, not guys. Not that anymore, dog. <laughs> NHLiberty.org.